One thing we haven't really discussed yet are what the typical values are for precession frequencies of protons in a magnetic field. Pretty much for any magnetic field strength that's useful to us analytically, these frequencies are going to show up in the megahertz range. And if you think about the fact that radio waves excite these rotations of the magnetization vector, this should make sense. Megahertz are in the radio wave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. The problem is that changes due to differences in chemical environment are at a much smaller scale on the order of a few hertz. And so in looking at the spectrum of a molecule, we're looking at numbers that are in the millions of hertz range, but differences that are on the order of one or two hertz. That's one part in a million, so those differences will be very tiny relative to the absolute precession frequencies. For this reason, and because of the dependence of the precession frequency on the magnetic field, we don't generally talk about frequency directly in NMR spectra. Instead, we use chemical shift, which lacks a dependence on the applied magnetic field and makes the numbers a lot more human-friendly, since we're talking about the shift in precession frequency relative to some standard. We'll talk about chemical shift in more detail in this video, and we'll also address integration, which is a tool we can use to determine the number of protons associated with a signal. We don't report frequencies directly on NMR spectra for two reasons. First of all, the precession frequency depends on the, the applied magnetic field, and so that frequency varies depending on the magnetic field strength in our instrument. And the second reason is that these differences in frequency for protons in distinct chemical environments are tiny, and this is true pretty much across the board, no matter the nucleus. For these two reasons, we use chemical shift rather than frequency on the x-axis of NMR spectra. And chemical shift is designed to address these two factors. It's defined as the downfield shift in precession frequency of a nucleus relative to an electron-rich standard, one that's heavily shielded, due to chemical factors, that is, due to differences in the electronic environment of the nucleus and differences in structure, and so on and so forth. Because chemical shift is defined as a downfield shift, heavily shielded nuclei will appear at low chemical shift on the right-hand side of spectra, while heavily deshielded nuclei will appear on the left-hand side of spectra at relatively high chemical shift. And the units here may look somewhat odd, parts per million, or ppm. And the question you should always ask when you see dimensionless ratio type units like this, like ppm or ppb, is parts of what per million of what, right? In the case of an NMR experiment, the units of chemical shift are really the shift due to the change in or difference in chemical environment in hertz per megahertz of the absolute precession frequency. So this goes back to the introduction to this video where we saw that the absolute precession frequencies are in millions of hertz, but the differences between chemically distinct nuclei are in hertz. When we divide that difference, let's call it delta nu, by the absolute precession frequency nu, where the denominator here typically refers to our electron-rich standard, and then we multiply that by 10 to the sixth, this gives us the chemical shift in parts per million. A totally equivalent way to think about this is to divide the change in frequency in hertz by the standard frequency in megahertz. This gives the chemical shift directly since what this ratio is is the change in frequency in hertz per million hertz of standard precession frequency. The standard we use here for proton NMR is a compound that has heavily shielded hydrogens. Because silicon is an electron donating atom, the hydrogens in these four methyl groups are relatively shielded, meaning that they appear upfield at low frequency. And the other advantage of this molecule as the standard is that it's got 12 hydrogens per molecule, and so it's got a very large number of hydrogens within it, which means it gives us a large signal, as we'll see in a second when we talk about integration. This molecule is called tetramethylsilane, or more commonly TMS, and it's the typical standard of 0.0 ppm for proton NMR. Other signals are reported as chemical shift relative to TMS. And just to give an example of how chemical shift works, let's say that we had a signal at 4.0 ppm in an NMR spectrum taken on an instrument for which the precession frequency of TMS was 200 megahertz. This is typical. The hundreds of megahertz nowadays is a, a standard for ordinary NMR spectrometers, although more sensitive spectrometers will have higher values 
than this. If the chemical shift is 4.0 ppm and the standard frequency is 200 megahertz, this means that the shift in precession frequency due to whatever chemical environment that this proton finds itself in is 800 hertz. Hopefully this drives the point home that the shifts in frequency are very small on the order of hertz relative to the precession frequency. One last point I'll make is that you often hear spectrometers quoted by the absolute precession frequencies of TMS that they give. The stronger the magnetic field, the higher B0, the higher this value gets, right? And so spectrometers with higher magnets will have higher values for the precession frequency of TMS. And these can get as high as 1,000 megahertz in spectrometers that need to be really sensitive to differences in chemical environment. Chemical shift relative to TMS is caused by a decrease in electron density near the hydrogen atom. And so on the far left of the NMR scale, we have protons that are heavily deshielded or electron poor. In previous videos, we've talked about factors that affect the distribution of electrons within a molecule. And the three most important, I would argue, for NMR are electronegativity, inductive effects, which are related to electronegativity in some way, and hybridization. All of these affect the proton chemical shift by altering the distribution of electrons in the molecule. And the right way to think about this is to really think on the level of electron density or partial charge at the hydrogen atom. We'll have more to say about this correlation chart in future discussions of actually determining structure from NMR spectra. But some things that we should notice now are the roles that these three factors play in dictating the ranges where we find typical types of protons. For example, it shouldn't be that surprising that a proton attached to a carbonyl group is found very downfield because the carbon that it's attached to is partially positive due to the electron withdrawing nature or the electronegative nature of the carbonyl oxygen. On the other hand, it makes sense that saturated alkanes should be some of the most upfield or shielded protons that we find since carbon is not very electronegative relative, for example, to oxygen or nitrogen, where we find those protons at higher chemical shift or more deshielded or more downfield. These are three ways of saying the same thing, essentially. Hybridization plays a role in the difference between saturated alkane protons and alkene protons, which show up at higher chemical shift. And although I won't delve into the explanation at this point, as we'll talk about it later, we can see that alkyne protons are relatively unique in that they're back to being shielded for reasons that we'll see later. And aromatic protons show up distinctly more deshielded than regular alkene protons do for a similar reason. For now, the primary punchline is that these three factors, electronegativity, inductive effects, and hybridization are the big players that determine where a particular type of proton shows up along the chemical shift scale. And although you should memorize these ranges, you should be able to apply these factors to predict the relative chemical shifts of two different sets of hydrogens within molecules.